Okay. Calling enablement. We probably want to get into the enablement part here. Okay, so next point. We are kind of very pointy here tonight. We go point by point. Uh, yes, only musically talented people are called in the music ministry. Oh, no. <laughs> I thought that if I would be the servant, serving God, even I don't have voice like uh, I could be in the music ministry. Actually, I could help you like in the music archive. I, I could use you in the music archive and you could help there or you could... You could uh, do a number of other things, but the actual ministering with music unfortunately goes so that you have to have some sort of musical talent. And musicians, okay, let's list some of the things that you really need. First of all, you need to have a good sense of rhythm. Whether you are singing or playing, you need a sense of rhythm. So if you are, if you cannot like follow. How the, how the beat goes and how, the, how everything goes. If you cannot clap, <laughs> clap when like we are singing together. It, and if you are like, like, if you are like that, it may be that you don't have a good sense of rhythm. Uh, uh, sense of harmony is another thing that you need in music so that you are you are able, because music has its in own inner logic. When you have two chords following after one another, it, they are not random, but there is a certain way how they go together and form different units of harmony. So uh, it's, uh, uh, you need to have a certain sense of harmony in order to be able to follow how the music goes. In the, in the popular music that we is quite kind of prevalent today. You also, in the music ministry, it really helps that you have ability to improvise a little bit so that you are not tied to written music. If you've been trained as, as a musician, just reading music, uh, some people just don't have ability to get out of it and they cannot play without, play without those rules given to them. And, and that may be a hindrance in the type of music ministry we do here. Uh, also, musicians, especially musicians and also singers, they need proficiency with their instrument. Uh, some people have a nice voice, but they cannot project their voice. They, ha they, they don't have a good diction. They might not have a good support where the voice is coming from. Uh, all kinds of things. And, and some amount of training and proficiency really, really helps in what they are doing. You can spend hundreds and thousands of hours with practice of all those things, so it is a big commitment to cultivate the talent that you have. The natural talent that musicians have, it enables the actual craft of music making, which is really what we are talking about here. And, and it enables professional results with what you are doing. And some people are naturally that much talented in certain areas. Some people just have a very beautiful voice and, and, and it seems that they're just getting everything for free. And that seems, seems kind of being the American dream. <laughs> so many people think like if they immediately can do something, oh, I'm so good with that, that's the thing I'm doing. And in fact, if you really want to be good with something, really good, you have to train and train and train and use countless hours. All these competitions like American Idol, like America's Got Talent, it's not about really just about talent. And it's not about that, oh, he's a, such a great singer. All of these people have a history. They've been doing what they've been doing. Even they haven't been trained, they've been perhaps doing it for a decade or two already. They already have been singing or doing something. Uh, and it's not just talent. There's a lot of hard work that goes to it. Singers need, obviously, a pleasant singing voice, but also they need an accurate ear. Sometimes I have, I have, we have people in all the churches where I have been, we have people that 
singers that have real trouble with their ear. Sometimes, sometimes I have met people who have really beautiful voice, but they have so bad musical ear that, that it actually really hampers them. And they sometimes have to learn the songs just by repeating it 100 times with a CD, and then they start like hitting the right notes. Sometimes people have that kind of handicap, and, 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 and we can have this, this kind of person sing, and perhaps nobody can detect that they have that problem, but it takes, makes it very hard if you don't have a good musical ear. Uh, it's not just the voice, but it's also the ability of adjusting your voice according to where it goes and singing in tune and, and so on. Also, the singers need a keen sense of rhythm also and timing, because if you are singing with somebody else, then we have, yeah, we have another category of singers. They, they all always come in at the wrong place. So you have to go it over many, many times and make something very clear, band plays something certain way, and then they know, okay, that's the time for me to come in. And you're wondering, like, like what's going on? But God has given them also a gift to minister. So you are not just like, uh, you're not just saying to somebody, oh, you have a problem with that. No, you cannot minister. You really want to work with people and give opportunities despite of those obvious handicaps. Some handicaps are totally impossible to really get over with, but many handicaps are such that you can work with them. So, uh, so some person is really good in that, and some people is really good in that, and has a handicap in that and that, and, and, and you just need to evaluate each person each person separately, and, and it's surprising. Surprising if you cultivate capacity, people, and rehearse properly, a lot of things can, can happen. Uh, some singers take many years to learn to sing harmonies, and some people just have that ability, just like that. Uh, I have a number of singers here in the church that I always put singing harmonies because they, are just, they just have that natural talent of matching matching these other voices to the songs and they can always find a way to blend in there. So I use those singers a lot. I can just throw them there and they just takes five, ten minutes and they are doing the right thing. It's quite amazing. And then some people I never ask to sing a harmony. I just they like God bless them, they have wonderful ministry with singing, but they should not try singing harmonies. They will always gear go back to the melody. And that's not much use to have them sing harmony. It just doesn't work out. But, but I think like you're getting an idea. There are very, very few really more or less perfect people out there at the stage. Everybody has some secret, some, some handicap, some, something that they have difficulty with. Surprise. Yeah. Everybody has something. Perhaps my, my biggest handicap is, uh, it's not really bad, but it is, <laughs> it, is ba it is bad enough for me to get in trouble sometimes. I, I basically, I do hang, handle rhythm or, or write, but I don't have a strong inner sense of rhythm. I'm, I'm so much trained that I don't have any problem with it, but, but, like, uh, but I make a terrible dancer, I can, I can, I, there's, there's times that I'm like just totally lost. I'm just wondering, I'm listening to what Joe is playing, like a song that I always get wrong is the Celebrate, Celebrate. I guess your heavy heart. No, no, how, how does it go? Something like, but anyway, I'm, I'm supposed to play piano and I'm hearing like Joe doing that complicated rhythm there. I don't have any idea where the downbeat is. And, 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 and it's just like, gets me every time. So, now I have told you a secret, like you will not tell anybody. Sometimes I have hardest time with the rhythm. So, but did anybody know it? Unless you would be in the band and even then you might not know it. But we all have our areas that are not really so strong. But it doesn't mean that we cannot do a lot. Perhaps I just need to train myself. Perhaps I just need to give time to myself to grow. 
perhaps I need to give grace to somebody else who has a weakness in the area. I just recognize, hey, this is just a thing that they have tough time. How can we get around it? And then we just minister with it and recognize that perhaps this is a difficult thing for them. Yes, David. With you kind of orchestrating the whole uh, band, how do you, how can you promote that same sense of like forgiving between different musicians? Say, if one musician's very good at rhythm and they just get tired of someone else making mistakes, how do you how can you kind of bring that in when there's tension? Um. Uh, unfortunately, it often works out so that uh, who is available. If it's so that we don't just have anybody better available to play a certain instrument who is called to be in the ministry, we just, we just have to work with this person. And, and oftentimes, oftentimes in the ministry, it might be the drum player or, or piano player you have to work with. Uh, drum playing is much more complicated than many people think about. It really takes a huge talent and a huge amount of practice to be able to do what, for example, Craig and Joe are doing out there. Those guys are just very talented in what they are doing. And, and sometimes people train for years and years to be able to do the same thing, and they are doing, but they don't have the same sense of music, the same sense of timing, same musical flexibility and ability of just really fit in, but they are very mechanical. You can do it mechanically, but do it musically and do it together with people is totally another thing. And, uh, and it's, uh, it's a thing that when you are in the ministry and you just have this many people that you can choose from, oftentimes it may be that everybody is kind of handicapped by somebody who needs to be there and is not that good, but only thing is that you just need to be very, very frank with a group of people. Hey, stop talking about that. Like, this, uh, this is, God has given us this person to work with and let's, let's just help him along. And, and, and just talk, talk directly about like if, if, you, if you start having this spirit in any music group or any team that some people are starting to talk down to somebody else like that's already gone too far. We should never even get to that situation. And it may be very frustrating and only thing that can deliver a musician from that bondage that like I cannot take it like this person drives me crazy they cannot do this and this and this uh, is just simply that they have not recognized this person's value in Christ yet. Only thing that can really deliver me about those things that I personally get a revelation of the body of Christ and I start understanding how it is about the body of Christ and it is not about our, yeah, yeah perhaps that frame, frame uh, thing is a good thing. And uh, yeah, I think that that's probably like all that we need to mention about that. Okay, um, let's go on. Uh, I want to finish. I really want to finish this thing. Okay. Second thing is that about who is only called to the music ministry, that only spiritually gifted people are called to the music ministry. We already talked a little bit about that earlier. But Holy Spirit gives sovereignly different gifts to the ministry, to minister in the body. And the ministerial gift, if I have that kind of ministerial gift that, I'm, uh, uh, that give, uh, gives me that ability to really minister with music, it means that I can manifest specific anointings through my singing and playing. So it's not just singing and playing, but somehow I'm, I'm filled with the spirit that way that I can be sensitive and carried along by the Holy Spirit just to complement the overall anointing. 
Sometimes people can do a lot of things, but they have no sensitivity in the spirit to complement the anointing. Um, even though this kind of music ministerial gift is not mentioned in the list of the gifts in the New Testament, uh, I, I do think that uh, something, something that of that sort is needed in the music ministry in order to be serving there. Um, and those people who have that gift, they usually are used by God a lot because God just has enabled them and gives grace and gives vision and gives renewal and they just find new songs and they just have a fire in their heart. Or they just, uh, just don't get tired of playing their instrument and they just are available and they are just there. Somebody has a gift like it always comes with certain kind of availability, if they have allowed God to bring that gift uh, into full, uh, full use. So this gift, ministerial gift, uh, enables people to play and sing with great freedom and ease. It doesn't mean that you might not be nervous. It doesn't mean that you might not have moments of self-consciousness and might not mean that you're always doing things correctly and you wouldn't make mistakes, but in general, you, it's, you just have a flow in that ministry. And that's what Pastor Stevens says usually, all, used to say also, that a spiritual gift is that certain area in the ministry where you just simply have, uh, have an ease of serving with. You just don't even notice so for somebody else, it's very difficult, but for you, it's just a natural. It's just like breathing, like it just happens. It's, you just function in that realm with a certain amount of ease and freedom. You stay in the presence of God, and, and you are just not awfully self-conscious and own strength conscious. Yes, sir? <laughs> Mr. Castro? interrupted the class and uh, gets the microphone. Um, okay. So what if you, I mean, there's going to be obligations and requirements and responsibility that comes with your gift when you're functioning. Uh, what if you are like not, I could he imagine just getting the response, take it to the cross. But what if you're like not prepared for what it is that you're like embarking on? Like there's things that you are just like, for you, you could say, okay, Sunday is coming. <laughs> but I just am not having a capacity to do what it is uh, that's coming. Yeah, you learn common sense by <laughs> doing things, don't you? Uh, you learn, um, yeah. The way to be spontaneous, first of all, always comes through preparation. If you are well prepared in, in general, then you can be spontaneous. And, and in, in one way, the more experience I have, the more carefree I can be about those situations. I know like this may be going this way or can go that way. And, 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 and I just trust God for it. Uh, but then there is situations that somebody really, you just know that they don't have capacity. And it is really kind of, oh, I shouldn't be using this. Uh, it's kind of a, a responsibility of the leader that they spot out what's going on. And that's the strength of the team. Let's say like there's a singer. I just know that it's going to be a disaster. I'm, I'm changing the plan. Right. There's nothing more complicated. It's, it's not just that singer's responsibility. If we are in the team, we have communication. We kind of have an idea of what's going on. So, as a leader, I'm helping out, like, hey, let's just wait for a couple of more weeks with that thing. Like, it's okay, just don't worry. We'll just find something else there. And, and those adjustments in the leadership in the music, they happen all the time. People all the time get into troubles. People fall sick. Singers fall sick all the time, and, and things are happening. People are dying, and they have to, like, fly to the funeral, and, and all kinds of things are happening. So... So just to make last-minute plans, as a leader, you learn to 
learn a certain flow in the ministry that you, you know who is able to fill in if something happens. But I wouldn't like to let people get, get to that uh, stage right before the service and knowing this is not going to work out. I would like to avoid that because that's very stressful for them. And that's very stressful for uh, it's not stressful for me. Just need to get something in five minutes to do it. <laughs> and usually there is somebody who can do something in five minutes. But, uh, but you know what I mean. You want, as a leader, it's my responsibility that, that people don't actually get to that place that uh, they would be so shaky and they're just afraid and so on. So uh, I think like a good leadership would take care of those situations. Yes. Okay, let's go on. Finish with... Um, oh, yeah. Uh, I think that you may be musically talented and you might not have a particular ministerial gift, but you are so available to God because you have a gift of helps. It's possible that some people might be ministering in the music ministry with the gift of helps for years and years and years. Just because they are so available just to helping out however they can and God is just honoring it. And perhaps they don't have a huge talent, perhaps they do not have a specific ability to manifest anointing, but they are available. And I think that uh, that's also possible. Sometimes I feel that I have done things in my life just because I have gift of helps, not that I'm like having any particular talent or gift for a certain area, but just being available to God brings you a long way sometimes. And, and you are just like, you are able to adjust to the situation. You have grace just to be helpful different ways. Yes, David. chose to kind of be useful in a different musical instrument, is that kind of along that line where they just saw a need and were available? Perhaps. Kind of yes, it's it's possible. I think that I think that uh, I think that uh, God is not like cut and dry, it just has to be exactly this way. I think there's people will with a lot of different reasons and foundations in the ministry why they are doing something. <laughs> I sometimes think that like I would really just love to be an usher. I like keep thinking like year after year after year like why am I doing music ministry? I would just love to be an usher. And it may be that I have a better gift like being an usher. I just like have just like a gift for that thing. But, uh, but hey, I'm available to God. At least I have been. I hope that I will be <laughs> in the future to do. I really cannot evaluate that thing. But you know what I mean. Is that, uh, uh, hey, you sometimes find yourself places that you really didn't plan to be in. And you never thought that you were getting trained for. This, is, this has been like my music minister thing here now in Baltimore has been a little bit that way. Uh, was not, not really planning this. And not was looking for is nor getting trained or equipped for that particularly for this time, but it just came out of uh, out of something else. Okay, last thing that last couple of things we want to wrap up this subject here. No more questions. Okay, <laughs> it's like what's the difference between musical talent and ministerial gift? This is kind of important. I think this is helpful just to think about. One thing is something that God has given with you in with your natural life, and something has been given to you with a new life in Christ. There's this natural thing, and then there's a supernatural thing. The gift enables uh, the person to be used by God in the ministry, and it is fully supernatural. Really, spiritual gift is fully supernatural. There's nothing natural about it. And it is given sovereignly by God to whomever he calls to minister in his plan. 
different ways. And um, that's why the musical talent is not for showing off, but it needs to be fully, mani uh, fully submitted to the gift that God has given to you. Uh, there's a lot of things many of us could be doing. And, and if we would be driven by our need to make ourselves important and significant, we would be showing off all kinds of things that we can do. <laughs> and, 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 and sometimes with musicians, it's a little bit the same way. Uh, sometimes musicians are very, very skillful, and you kind of see only just part what they can do in the ministry, because they are not there to show off. You would think, oh, they're just playing piano, and actually they could do a lot of things with piano. They are, they are, they are, they are singing these simple songs, but actually they could do very difficult, uh, some operatic songs or something like that, and you would never know just because they are just doing what they are doing n because they are ministering, not showing off. Any kind of glamorizing the talent that you might have, it really works against the ministry that God wants to be doing. It's totally alien to the purpose of the ministry to be glamorizing people's talents. That's why we don't have any superstars. Like, we don't have preaching superstars, we don't have uh, teacher superstars, like anything like that. Everything, everything has, to be, has to be aligned to this purpose of the ministry. And um, so, musical talent, what are, the, what are the differences? Musical talent is natural, ministerial gift is supernatural, comes through the new birth. Musical talent is God-given but it is inherited and it can be nurtured. But the ministerial gift is simply God-given. Of course, we grow in faith as we are using, the, and we learn to be more available to God, and it seems that the gift is growing. But in fact, the gift is, gift is just a gift, and it, we have all of it. We just learn to be available to God to uh, minister through that gift. So it is not, cannot be nurtured like the natural talent can be nurtured. Uh, so musical talent can be developed. That's, that's kind of the same thing here. But the ministerial gift cannot be developed. But it may be revealed in degrees. And usually why it is revealed in degrees depends on the plan of God and also my spiritual capacity. First, my spiritual capacity is really small, and, and not everything what God has in that gift is revealed because I'm kind of hindering that manifestation. Uh, next point about the difference is musical talent is corrupted by sin. It's corrupted by sin. So it's not the perfect, beautiful thing that we are actually given to people, but the ministerial gift is incorruptible. And it is something that is God is using and there are situations when God is using that ministerial gift even when people are living in sin. It's like kind of unbelievable that it can be happening, but sometimes God sovereignly is using people, using people even like when they are very shaking ground in their lives. Then musical talent belongs to the realm of natural good, but ministerial gift always manifests a divine anointing. So don't be too, too star, starstruck when people are able to do things. It's just not that talent that counts. It's really what God brings through the gift that is supernatural. And both of them are necessary for the music ministry. Okay, um, I have a thing in the handout that you will be just reading on your own. It's about how to evaluate musicians and singers. And this is more like a teaching concerning if you ever get to a place that you, you would have to pay attention to who, sh who is able to do what and what, uh, about what, what kind of things, uh, ab abilities singers need, what kind of abilities instrument players need. I have that available there, but I will finish this portion about the talents and everything else. Just watching the clock like it just has a life of its, life of its own. It's going <laughs> don't like it, but anyway.
But last statement, I hope that this edifies you, is that only good musician is a dead musician. You may have heard it about the Native American Indians before, but that's not the right context. The right context is in the music ministry. The only good musician is a dead musician. And what do, what do I mean with that is exactly that. If I have a talent, uh, I, I, I guarantee you, if you, would, if you are in the music team, you know what flesh can do. <laughs> you have seen it many times and you see people fighting about opinions and, and, and getting critical about others and everything else. Hurt egos, fights over opinions, driven personalities driving people to do driven productions. <laughs> yeah, puffed up personalities, all kinds of things. But all of that has to be brought to the cross. Uh, no talent is good in the kingdom of God unless it really goes through the cross. No talent. Not even talents that I take for granted that I have. All those strengths that I depend on, all of them, they have to go through the cross in order to be any quality of the resurrection life. The talents and expert opinions have to bow before the Prince of Peace and submit to the spirit of unity. Oh, I, I really, I, I'm really getting poetic here. Like, let me read it from here. <laughs> Music ministry needs to be a bastion of finished work in action, an extension wing of the Mount Calvary. Ooh, I like that. <laughs> His or her, her amount of talent will never make up for the destruction that a carnal musician leaves behind. Wow. That is why we have to trust God and leave our talents, opinions, and experiences at the foot of the cross and enter resurrection life. That supernatural life is what matters in ministry, not our abilities or our egos. Anybody here with an ego? <laughs> no. We know, James, you just, you just are. We never canonized anybody yet here in this church like it may. Or not happen. Okay, so in the local church, uh, the only good musician is a dead musician. Okay. Any, any little questions about that? You like it? I think like I, I just cannot get it out of my mind. It's just, it's just so true. When, when we go out there practicing, it's just like, just, just, it has to be from God. It cannot be from God if it's from me. It has to come from God. I, I just have to go to the cross. Okay. All right, class number two. We are in a very interesting subject. And I'm, I'm afraid that, uh, that this subject could be dealt with uh, two or three classes and still be not enough for it. But we go to a very exciting beginnings of everything that we know about church music, and that's with King David. Even though like we are all good dispensationalists and we, we like are holding on to the beautiful system of dispensations that we have and learning here in the Bible college, I'm like a little bit, little bit like suggesting a little sub-point there, and that would be King David and his... Uh, this new dispensation of worship music used for worshiping God. If we are thinking about King David and his life, uh, he lived in the dispensation of grace, uh, grace law. That's meaning like I just made a mistake. Like he lived in the dispensation of law. If you are looking at the tabernacle, as is explained in the Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, all those uh, books of Moses, you find all kinds of instructions, but you don't hear one single word about praising God, singing to God with music. You do find hymn of Moses. You find a hymn that uh, Miriam like, uh, 
he was, she was, she was singing there and all kinds of things, but it was not connected to the tabernacle. That tabernacle there, it's possible that somebody might have been singing praise to God there. I don't count it out, but it was not organized. And, and, and the thing is that everything what we learn about approaching God from the law, it is very structured, it is very, very grim. It's, it's, it's almost like uh, very unemotional. You just keep doing these sacrifices and keep obeying all these rules and everything else. And it was perfect. It was beautiful and perfect. And it was wonderful revelation of what God is doing and what's really, what, uh, what this is all about. But then, it's not before David, whom we know had a very, very specific understanding about finished work. That it was only with David that the music in the service of God started all together in the Bible. And I find it like very, very interesting. The man who actually really understood the grace of God, the man who had a very amazing personal relationship with God, a man who was a musician himself, to him, God gave the freedom of instituting something that never was before in Israel. And that was worship of God with music at the tabernacle first and then in the temple. All those amazing things that we are reading from the, later on in the book of Second Chronicles and, uh, and, and also First Kings and Second Kings, where we find all these uh, amazing musicians and kings and praising God and bringing the troops to the battle with the uh, priests singing. All of that was cultivated in the temple that Solomon built and that all was prepared for that purpose by King David. So I think like there's a very, very good reason that we could say that something really changed in the God's plan for his people through King David. A lot of things. Obviously, we have a new Davidic uh, covenant. We have um, all kinds of things happening there. But I, I really consider David to be the father of worship with the people of God. So, reading from Second Chronicles 5.13, and I think this is also the, I think this verse is 11 through 14. Second Chronicles 5. Uh, it came even to pass as the trumpeters and singers were as one to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord. And when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music and praised the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Then, that then the house was filled with the cloud, even the house of the Lord. And... And, and somehow, somehow we find out that, uh, that the very moment that the whole congregation, all those priests, they were all making music, and it was not just spontaneous blasting of trumpets, it was organized music. Like, and there was choirs, all these things, and everybody had the same praise, and they were all like one. And that was the moment when the blessing came to the temple, and the, in, a, in a way the temple was anointed and God's presence was manifested there. Isn't that so like, like the same thing that you would find from Psalm 131? I think like when the brethren dwell in unity, you have this same amazing anointing there. Let's just think about how, how uh, Think about the high priest of Israel, one time in his life, is receiving the anointing for his calling. He is in this festive garment. He is in front of like these thousands and tens of thousands of people there. And, and the holy anointing oil that's going to be poured one time that way to his head, is going to be soaked in that anointing oil and it is dripping off like everywhere to his clothes everywhere, like very special thing. And God is saying, 
when we are one and we have that unity, that's the same power, same anointing that we have than that high priest had in that anointing. That's an amazing picture. And, 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 and I believe that that singing, gathering of hearts in oneness, in praise, is that very way how God wants to tune our hearts together when we are together to enter that same kind of anointing as the body of Christ. Somehow, King David got an understanding and a revelation that the people of God need to be organized and enabled to enter such praise so that God's manifestation and, and God's anointing for his people could be, uh, could, be, could be manifested in that situation. And I believe that God has appointed praise and music in the church for that same purpose. Uh, think about it. Let's say that we have an audience of people. We all come, come like wherever we are coming. And, and instead of singing, we all think about same thoughts. <laughs> What would be a result of that? We are all thinking about same thoughts. Okay, that's, that's not bad. Okay, let's say that we are all saying the same words together. That's pretty good too. You have all these pauses, like you have all these, when you are speaking, you have these pauses. <laughs> and, and so, but somehow that all is brought to even a higher level when we all are carrying our voice continuously together. Uh, not in any mystical way, but we are simply all tuned in in a very practical way, just following the same thing, and we all, all are active and carrying it, and it is beautiful. If I'm thinking about congregation singing from that, that viewpoint, it's, it, it somehow opens, opens to my heart that in all simplicity, there's, it is a very powerful thing that everybody, all the people of God, are actually joining in the one voice and carrying it through the extended period of time, confessing the truth and making it beautiful and opening their hearts to God. I think that singing together is a very powerful form of worship. And, and, and God God wants to pour his blessing and wants to pour his anointing upon that because that simply unites our hearts very special way together. You get the point? Uh, I think that that's, that's one of the easiest ways to accomplish anything like that. If we are just all just thinking about the same thoughts, it doesn't have the same manifestation. It doesn't take the same action. It's not, not just bring it out, out of out of us the same way, and even talking together the Bible verses just doesn't have the same effect. But when we start singing, it starts flowing in a special way, that unity. And that's why I believe that everyone who is in that auditorium, uh, I, I'm not saying that there are not times that God is inviting me to be quiet. There are times that like, I might be quiet while others are singing. Of course, like there's no law, but I think God is inviting all of us to join that same voice singing. So that it's not just half of the audience that's singing and half of them are like standing and enduring and having their private prayer time. But I believe that that manifestation of unity through singing is something that God has appointed for us. And, and this is one of the things that I believe that King David had a revelation about. Uh, King David is the founder of the music ministry proper in the Old Testament. And we, I just read these verses from Second Chronicles 5. Uh, this awesome scene was about the dedication of the Solomon's temple, where this all was taking place. And they had 120 trumpeteers, but that's, that was just like a, a small part of it. The, out of 38,000 Levites in the Solomon's temple, 4,000 were musicians and singers. Are you, are you hearing these numbers? <laughs> and this was all prepared 
by the ministry that David started, and, and, and it became into a magnificent use under Solomon. Um, we, when we are thinking about this personal revelation of grace that uh, David had, uh, he, he, he had probably like just a vision and burden in his heart that he would love to see it happen. He, w- he would probably see all these Israelites going about and bringing their sacrifices uh, to the tabernacle and, and all kinds of scattered. And, 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 and then he would hear them singing in the fire, fireside. They would have fire in the evening. Everybody would be singing together in small groups. And there were songs in Israelites' hearts. If you wanted to have music, how do you have music? By singing yourself, right? So uh, it would be a kind of a normal thing that I just sing, sing, sing. Even I wouldn't have much of a voice, but I still would sing my prayers to God. I would give my complaints to God like through words of the songs, and I would be singing. And, but David would, would be watching the Israelites and saying, like, what an amazing thing it would be if we would have all these people in the presence of God, how I am going to the presence of God, and they would be united under the one spirit and one anointing. And I believe that it was something like that that just beckoned him to just go on by faith in this vision. And, and the result of that vision is like amazing. Think about 4,000 <laughs> full-time Singers and musicians, all organized in these guilds, sons learning it from their fathers, being trained, and this is their life's calling and vocation. Uh, and, I, and I think that, and I think like it really gives us several different teachings about what is the, what is the importance of the music ministry and what is the possibility of the music ministry, but I think we will do it after the break. So we'll continue here, nine past eight. Okay, amen.